Bible says, my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I, I wonder, do you know him? <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Tyler couldn't find any fault in him. Terror couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! Well, haven't we been talking about a king today? I'm not sure you need me, to be honest. What we've just seen is just amazing, very powerful. So in talking about kings, I just wonder what has happened in our past? What stories have we experienced or movies that we've watched or stories we've been told that form our understanding of what is a king? I can remember when I was younger, I loved to watch movies like Robin Hood and King Richard and King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Those images are formed by some very creative people who put together scripts and costumes and that sort of thing. So I've got to admit, those have gone a long way to shaping what my understanding of kings are. Kings in our past understanding have usually been people of influence, often very wealthy. And over the period of history, we've seen that they've been anywhere on a scale from wicked to kind and benevolent kings and anywhere in between. We expect a king to be good for a country, to provide wisdom, leadership, and act in the interests of the people for their well-being. It's not always been the case. Leaders in lots of different settings have actually preyed on their people and have done a huge amount of damage. This picture of a medieval village 
And if you have a look at that picture, you can see it's a town that's crowded. It's got lots of houses in it. It's got a big house where the king or the leader of that village would live. It's got a wall around the outside of it. It's got limited entry gates, maybe two or three, and you'll see houses inside. Now, we don't see it so much in this, but in history, there would be people living outside those walls on farms where they would be farming for food for the village. People would apply their trades and they would teach young people those trades and they'd pass it on. And a village like this would be self-sufficient. The kings often would have their own army in a town like this. So if there was ever an enemy attacks this village, all the people would come inside the walls and receive the protection of those walls. You can see on the walls there are guard posts and lookouts and the army would protect the, the town and repel the enemy so that people could go back to living their lives in peace. The king in this village would often also have a, a standard or a flag. Flags are very important in our history. They reflect our identity and our belonging in a community. And those flags that go out at any time the king went out with his army, he'd carry his standard. And, and people would accept their identity under that flag. And they regard themselves as citizens of that place. Now, the next one shows what Jerusalem was like in the time of Jesus, and that was also a walled city. So walled cities have been all around the place for the protection of people, to gather them together into communities and for their protection. In this one, we can see the red and white striped area was the temple, and that in Jerusalem was the most important building in the town. But again, they had places to live and they'd have people living outside the walls and they'd have only a few entry gates into that city. This city was very precious to the Israelites, but they were taken into captivity at one point in their history, well, several actually, and they were taken off to a foreign land and they had to leave their place where their identity was. And living in captivity, they had plenty of time to think on the reasons why they were allowed to be taken into captivity because of their disobedience to God. They forgot about keeping to his ways and they adopted the ways of the surrounding peoples. They intermarried with surrounding peoples and they left the ways of the Lord and he allowed them to be taken into captivity. And in captivity, they mourned for the absence from their land and they longed to return. And the short version of the history is that there did come a time when Ezra was allowed to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Rebuilding the temple had become very important to them. Sometime later, Nehemiah was allowed to return to rebuild the walls. And this was also a very important thing for them because it was their city was being restored. And in both cases, the people who came back to do the rebuilding, they were led by godly men. And in the rebuilding process, they also confessed their sins and dedicated themselves again to the Most High God. Now we had the first reading today was the prophecy from Zephaniah that said that the Messiah was returning as a king on a donkey. And as we approach Easter and we read that story, we see the people of Israel also knew that their Messiah was prophesied to come back and that he would come on a donkey and he was coming in humility and gentleness. And this is not what we generally think about kings. We generally think about them with power and authority and exerting their authority. But Jesus came as a gentle king on a donkey, on a small donkey, not a great big white horse, but a small donkey that had never been ridden before. On that day, they rejoiced as Jesus entered Jerusalem. 
and they waved their flags, their palm leaves, they laid their clothes on the ground, and they were acknowledging him as king. However, only a few days later, Jesus was crucified. And a lot of people would be thinking, what happened? We thought he was going to be our king. They'd been around 500 years under the oppression of outside nations. And they were looking for a king to release them into freedom. And they had high hopes for freedom and the release from oppression. So Jesus, in a way, did something they were not expecting. And the outcome they weren't expecting, they were wondering, what is this all about a Messiah? Is he really Messiah? But Jesus is not like human kings. He was the servant king, gentle and riding on a donkey, as was prophesied. For us in modern times, we've lost our concept of kingship. We've got to talk about Australia because that's where we live. The Queen has been the monarch, Australia, and that concept has gradually been eroded and now the King doesn't really have a great deal to do with the running of our country. A lot of people would be quite happy to not have a King at all. So our system of government has become a democracy and in a democracy we've got neighbours and people we know who are willing to put themselves up for election to become decision makers in our country. And when we have a vote, a government is formed and then they get to make decisions for the next three or four years. And then if we're not happy with what they've done, we vote them out and somebody else becomes the government. And this is all based on a split in the vote. If whoever wins 51% of the votes gets to be in charge, and in every case, uh, more and more, in fact, we do see votes that go to this very fine margin. It's, you never see 70% of the people agree. So we've always got about half the people who are happy and half the people who are not happy. And this can be a bit of a revolving door where different people get to be in charge over a period of time. So how do you form loyalty? And I'll bet anything that in this room alone, in amongst people who are you know, Christian in their belief, I bet you will have extremes of belief from one end to the other and all the way in the middle about what we think about our democratic governments. And where is loyalty? Where is the ongoing permanence of leadership? Where is stability? Jesus' kingship is different. And we read some scriptures earlier talking about who Jesus is as king. There were many scriptures in the Old Testament prophecies hundreds of years before Jesus came, which describes that he was going to be mighty and he will be a king and a leader and he will be our protection and our saviour. I hope you loved that video that we saw with all those names of Jesus. I tried to write some things down. It went a bit fast for me. But I certainly hope that those words describing Jesus as king are going to sink in. I hope you will think on these things and let them sink in because lots of our understanding of leadership is formed by something we hear about every day. It's on the radio, the television, in the newspapers of a democratic system where nobody is particularly important enough for us to give 100% allegiance. However, in Philippians 3, 20 and 21, the Bible tells us that we are citizens of the kingdom of God. Now, we are all citizens of Australia, maybe some from other countries, but when we declare Jesus is our Lord and King of Kings, we are recognising this higher citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Jesus is the 100% king 
Think about that. 100% king. Are you, am I, a 100% subject to the king? Is there anything in your life or mine that loves something else more than Jesus? Is there anything in my life that I would hesitate to give up if I was asked to do something for the Lord? It, we've all got to answer those questions because we need to get to that point where we're 100% in allegiance to our king because our king is different. He's the gentle king. He taught us about the kingdom of God. He showed love. He brought healing. He brought grace and mercy to the people. And I just want to take us to Romans, the chapter 12 in Romans. Because this chapter, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but we are going to see some details. Romans chapter 12 is a wonderful description of what the kingdom of God looks like in this day and age. Firstly, we're asked to offer ourselves up as living sacrifices, as our true and proper worship. And we are spurred on to be transformed by the renewing of our minds rather than being conformed to this world. Now. Going back to the description of our democracy, our thinking is very formed by all those things that we hear every day. We need to present ourselves to allow our thinking to be renewed because what we see in the, the essence of democracy is very different to how Jesus wants us to be living. So this chapter helps us to understand what the kingdom of God looks like. And if it doesn't look like that in your life, then I challenge you to meditate on it and go to the Lord and say, how do you want me to respond here? He also, he goes on to tell us we've got all these gifts that he's given for the building up of the body. And we've all got one of these at least, prophesying, teaching, giving, showing mercy, serving, encouraging, leadership, Many gifts from one spirit, and these are for the building up of the body. Now, I, I ask you to think on how many of these gifts you see exhibited in the neighborhood, the place where we live, in our schools, in our workplaces. We're asked to walk humbly with our God. So the last part of the chapter gives us some really clear words of examples. So we love sincerely. We hate evil and cling to good. We are devoted to one another. We honour one another. We keep our spiritual fervour. We're joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. We share with God's people who are in need and we practise hospitality. We bless those who persecute us and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. And then it goes on to tell us to live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but associate with people of low position. Don't be conceited. Don't repay evil for evil. Do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Live in peace with everyone as far as you can. Don't take revenge. And right at the end, don't become overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I don't know about you, but we hear a lot about ugly things that happen in our society. But this word tells us that when we're submitted to King Jesus and his Holy Spirit dwells in us, we can take on evil, we can overcome evil with good. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4, we read, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And all of those things that we've just read in Romans 12 describes the weapons of our warfare. They're weapons of humility, of love, of kindness, of grace and mercy to the people all around us. So think on these things. 
temptations come to us a lot that if we are attacked by somebody, maybe a spontaneous reaction is to try and protect ourselves or attack back. This doesn't fit with what we've just read in Romans 12. We get all sorts of temptations to do what the people around us are doing. But we need to be so soaked into the Spirit of God and into his teaching of humility, love, grace, mercy, and so on, that we have weapons that have divine power to demolish strongholds. And each one of us can do this. You don't have to be specially talented. You don't have to be specially recognized. You just have to be a child of the King where not I live, but Christ lives in me. His spirit indwells us to give us the power to be what he wants us to be in the citizenship of the kingdom of God. And now we get to, I'm going to bring back Psalm 24 that we heard read to us before. Jesus is now seated on the throne at the right hand of God. And we submit ourselves to his sovereignty. We humble ourselves before him, acknowledge our sins and repent so that we can come to him with clean hands and a pure heart. Now, as Jesus was entering Jerusalem way back then and he was being received by the people as king, he's seated on the throne with God right now. But he comes every day into our lives to say, I'm the king of glory who's coming to you. Are you receiving me? Today and every day we can say he is the king of glory. He's our king. He's my king. He's your king. So I'm going to show you this next slide, which is a declaration that we can make. We can do this every day. And in fact, Starting the day with a declaration like this is a great start to giving God place in our lives for the day. You are my king. I submit myself to you. I receive your love, your mercy and grace, your power for today. I rejoice that you dwell in my life as king and I praise you. So I'm just going to ask you now to stand with me where just about finished. I'm going to ask you to stand and read through this declaration with me and take it for your own. So can we have that slide back, Mark? Right, if you would like to stand and let's say this together and say it as loud and as heartily as you can muster. You are my king. I submit myself to you. I receive your love your mercy and grace, your power for today. I rejoice that you dwell in my life as king. I praise you. Glenys has painted a picture of are we surrendered to the king of kings? And as we sing this, I invite you to say, Lord, I want to submit to your lordship, your authority. I want to be surrendered to your kingship. You came in on that Jerusalem on that donkey but you are the King of Kings. Let's, as we sing, surrender. And uh, I challenge us all to hear what Glenna said. And in Romans 12, it described how we should treat each other. Maybe friends today, as we sing, let's commit ourselves to treat each other like Romans 12 called us to. Let's sing it together.